Hi, Team Persevere. Today we're reading chapters 36 and 37 in Holes. We are going to start off with a review. So we're going to stop and think what happened in Holes on Friday. Pause to discuss. The word theory. Have you ever heard this word before? What do you think it means? Throw your ideas into the chat. Pause the video to discuss. A theory is an idea or set of ideas that is meant to explain facts or events. We can make theories about characters. To do this, we can come up with character traits that describe the character. Then we can connect these traits together to draw a conclusion about the character. So an example of this is I have Woody here and I have three character traits to describe Woody. I said that he's loyal, smart, and loving. Then I thought about how these three traits were connected together. And I wrote a little summary on the right and black saying my theory about Woody is that he cares deeply about his friends and wants everyone to be happy. He is smart and tries to solve problems that come his way. You are going to be doing the same thing today, but with the character Stanley. At the end of the story, or at the end of our reading today as a whole group, you're going to choose three character traits, and you can always use your blue character traits sheet in your supply bag. And you're going to think about how these three traits are connected and come up with a little explanation for your theory. They put four of the unbroken jars in the burlap sack in case they might not be able to use them. Stanley carried the stack, the sack. Zero held the shovel. I should warn you, Stanley said. I'm not exactly the luckiest guy in the world. Zero wasn't worried. When you spend your whole life living in a hole, he said, the only way you can go is up. They gave each other the thumbs up sign and headed out. It was the hottest part of the day. Stanley's empty, empty, empty canteen was still strapped around his neck. He thought back to the water truck and wish he'd at least stopped and filled his canteen before running off. They had gone very far before Zero had another attack. He clutched his stomach as he let himself fall to the ground. Stanley could only wait for it to pass. The sploosh had saved Ciro's life, but it was now destroying him from the inside. He wondered how long it would be before he, too, felt the effects. He looked at Big Thumb. It didn't seem any closer than, it, than when they first started out. Ciro took a deep breath and managed to sit up. Can you walk? Stanley asked him. Just give me a second, Ciro said. He took another deep, another breath, then, using the shovel, pulled himself back to his feet. Stanley gave the thumbs up sign and they continued. Sometimes Stanley would try to go for a long while without looking at Big Thumb. He'd make a mental snapshot of how it looked, then waited maybe 10 minutes before looking at it again to see if it seemed closer. It never did. It was like chasing the moon. And if they ever reached it, he realized that he, they'd still have to climb it. I wonder who she was, said Zero. Who? Mary Lou, said Zero. Stanley smiled. I guess she was once a real person on a real lake. It's hard to imagine. I bet she was pretty, said Zero. Somebody must have loved her a lot to name a boat after her. Yeah, said Stanley. I bet she looked great in bathing suit, sitting in the boat while her boyfriend rowed. Zero used a shovel as a third leg. Two legs weren't enough to keep him, to keep him up. I got to stop and rest, he said after a while. Now we know who the real Mary Lou is, and who is Mary Lou? Think back to a few chapters below and to make that connection. Pause the video to discuss. Stanley looked at Big Thumb. It still didn't look any closer. 
He was afraid if Zero stopped, he might never get started again. We're almost there, he said. He wondered which was closer, Camp Green Lake or Big Thumb. I really have to sit down. Just see if you can go a little. Zero collapsed. The shovel stayed up a fraction of, the sec of a second longer, perfectly balanced on the tip of the blade. Then it fell next to him. Zero knelt, bent over with his head on the ground. Stanley could hear a very low moaning sound coming from him. He looked at the shovel and couldn't help but think that he might need it to dig a grave, Zero's last hole. And who would dig a grave for me, he thought, but Zero didn't get up. But Zero did get up, once again, flashing thumbs up. Give me some words, he said weakly. It took Stanley a few seconds to realize what he meant. Then he smiled and said, R U N. Zero sounded it out his, himself. Er, un, run, run, good, F U N, F un. The spelling seemed to help Zero. It gave him something to concentrate on besides his pain and weakness. It distracted Stanley as well. The next time he looked up at the big thumb, it really did seem closer. They quit spelling words when it hurt too much to talk. Stanley's throat was dry. He was weak and exhausted. Yet as bad as he felt, he knew that Zero felt 10 times worse. As long as Zero could keep going, he could keep going too. It was possible, he thought. He hoped that he didn't get any of the bad bacteria. Zero hadn't been able to unscrew the lid. Maybe the bad germs couldn't get in either. Maybe the bacteria were only in the jar jars which opened easily, the ones he was now carrying in his sack. What scared Stanley the most about dying was an actual death. He figured he could handle the pain. It wouldn't be much worse than what he felt now. In fact, maybe at the moment of his death, he would be too weak to feel the pain. Death would be a relief. What worried him the most was that was the thought of his parents not knowing what happened to him, not knowing whether he was dead or alive. He hated to imagine what it would be like for his mother and father day after day, month after month, not knowing, living on false hope. For him, at least, it would be over. For his parents, the pain would never end. He wondered if the warden would send out a search party to look for him. It didn't seem likely. She didn't send anyone to look for Zero, but no one cared about Zero. They simply destroyed his files. But Stanley had a family. She couldn't pretend he was never there. He wondered what she would tell them and when. What do you think's up there? Zero asked. Stanley looked at, to the top of Big Thumb. Oh, probably an Italian restaurant, he said. Zero managed to laugh. I think I'll get a pepperoni pizza and a large root beer, said Stanley. I want an ice cream sundae, said Zero, with nuts and whipped cream and bananas and hot fudge. The sun was almost directly in front of them. The thumb pointed up toward it. They came to the end of the lake. Huge white stone cliffs rose up before them. Unlike the eastern shore where Camp Green Lake is situ situated, the western sh shore did not slope down gradually. It was as if they had been walking across the flat bottom of a giant frying pan, and now they had to somehow climb up out of it. They could no longer see Big Thumb. The cliffs blocked their view. The cliffs also blocked the sun. Zero groaned and clutched his stomach, but he remained standing. I'm all right, he whispered. Stanley saw, Stanley saw a rut about a foot wide and six inches deep running down the cliff. On either side of the rut were a series of ledges. Let's try there, he said. It looked to be about a 50 foot climb straight up. Stanley still managed to hold the sack of jars in his left hand as he slowly moved up from ledge to ledge, crisscrossing the rut. At times, he had to use the side of the rut for support in order to make it to the next ledge. Zero stayed with him somehow. His frail body trembled terribly as he climbed the stone wall. 
Some of the ledges were wide enough to sit on. Others stuck out no more than a few inches, just enough for a quick step. Stanley stopped about two thirds of the way up on a fairly wide ledge. Zero came up alongside him. You okay, Stanley said. Stanley asked. Zero gave the thumbs up sign. Stanley did the same. He looked above him. He wasn't sure how he'd get to the next ledge. It was three or four feet above his head and he didn't have any footholds. He was afraid to look down. Give me a boost, said Zero. Then I'll put you up there with the shovel. You won't be able to pull me up, said Stanley. Yes, I will, said Zero. Stanley cupped his hands together and Zero stepped on his interwoven fingers. He was able to lift Zero high enough for him to grab the protruding slab of rock. Stanley continued to help him from below as Zero pulled himself onto the ledge. While Zero was getting himself situated up there, Stanley, uh, Stanley's attached, Stanley attached the sack to the shovel by poking the hole through the burlap. He held it up to Zero. Zero first grabbed hold of the sack, then the shovel. He set the shovel so that half the blade was supported by the rock slab. The wooden shaft hung down as Stanley, towards Stanley. Okay, he said. Stanley doubted this was, would work. It was one thing for him to lift Zero, who was half his weight. It was another for Zero to try and pull him up. Stanley grabbed hold of the shovel as he climbed up the rock wall, using the sides of the rut to support him. His hands moved one over the other up the shaft of the shovel. He felt Zero's hand clasp his wrist. He let go of the shaft with one hand and grabbed the top of the ledge. He gathered his strength for a brief second, seemed to defy gravity as he took a quick step up the wall and with Zero's help pulled himself the rest of the way over the ledge. He caught his breath. There was no way he could have done that a few months ago. He noticed a large spot of blood on his wrist. It took him a moment to realize that it was Zero's blood. Zero had deep gashes in both hands. He had held to the metal blade of he had held onto the metal blade of the shovel, keeping it in place as Stanley climbed. Zero brought his hands to his mouth and sucked up his blood. One of the glass jars had broken in the sack. They decided to save the pieces. They might need to make a knife or something. They rested briefly, then continued on up. It was a fairly easy climb the rest of the way. When they reached flat ground, Stanley looked up to see the sun, a fiery bulb balancing on the top of Big Thumb. God was twirling a basketball. Soon they were walking in the long, thin shadow of the thumb. We're almost there, said Stanley. He could see the base of the mountain. Now that they were really almost there, it scared him. Big Thumb was his only hope. If there was no water, no refuge, then they'd have nothing, not even hope. There was no exact place where the flatland stopped and the mountain began. The ground got steeper and steeper and there was no doubt that they were heading up the mountain. Stanley could no longer see Big Thumb. The slope of the mountain was in the way. It became too steep to go straight up. Instead, they zigzagged back and forth, increasing their altitude by small increments every time they changed directions. Patches of weeds dotted the mountainside. They walked from one patch to another, using the weeds as footholds. As they got higher, the weeds got thicker. Many had thorns. They had to be careful walking through them. Stanley would have liked to stop and rest, but he was afraid they'd never get started again. As long as Zero could keep going, he could keep going too. Besides, he knew they didn't have much daylight left. As the day darkened, bugs began appearing above the weed patches. A swarm of gnats hovered around them, attracted by their sweat. Neither Stanley nor Zero had the strength to swat them away, swat at them. How are you doing? Stanley asked. Zero pointed, thumbs up, then said, 
If a gnat lands on me, it will knock me over. Stanley gave him some more words. E-U-G-S, he spelled. Zero concentrated hard, then said, Books? Stanley laughed. A wide smile spread across Zero's sick and weary face as well. Bugs, he said. Good, said Stanley. Remember a short U if there is no E at the end. Okay, here's the hard one. How about L-U-N-C-H? La, la, aunt. Stanley, suddenly, Zero made a horrible wrenching noise as he doubled over and grabbed his stomach. His frail body shook violently and he threw up, emptying his stomach of the sploosh. He leaned on his knees and took several deep breaths. Then he straightened up and continued going. The swarm of gnats stayed behind, preferring the contents of Zero's stomach to the sweat on the boy's face. Stanley didn't give him any more words, thinking he needed to save his strength. But about 10 or 15 minutes later, Zero said, lunch. As they climbed higher, the patches of weeds grew thicker and they had to be careful not to get their feet tangled in the thorny vines. Stanley suddenly realized something. There hadn't been any weeds on the lake. Weeds and bugs, he said. That's got to be water. There's got to be water around somewhere. We must be getting close. Let's make a prediction. What do you think is going to happen next? Pause the video to discuss. A wide clown-like smile spread across Zero's face. He splashed, he flashed, thumbs up sign, then fell. He didn't get up. Stanley bent over him. Come on, Zero, he urged. We're getting close. Come on, Hector. Weeds and bugs. Weeds, weeds and boogs. Stanley shook him. I've already ordered your hot fudge sundae, he said. They're making it right now. Zero said nothing. So right now, thinking about Stanley, what are three character traits you could use to describe Stanley? And then write, what are a few sentences that you could use to wrap up and connect all three of those traits? I'm going to take a few hands for this question. Please pause the video to discuss.